Hi everybody, welcome to a lecture on cellular respiration. So, you know, we have to begin somewhere and when you're looking for good images of mitochondria and you stumble upon gold like this, you just have to include it. So let's go here. Now, you have seen the next few slides before when we did cellular respiration, I'm sorry, when we did photosynthesis and, and nothing has changed. The idea is as follows. When we are doing photosynthesis, what we're doing is we're taking carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight and making a sugar, as you now know, a sugar and releasing oxygen. That is what plants do photosynthetically using chloroplast. They take carbon dioxide and water plus energy from the sun as sunlight and they crank out a sugar molecule in oxygen. Whereas cellular respiration done by mitochondria, by us and plants, okay, they, we all have mitochondria, cellular respiration is the process of taking the glucose or a sugar from this process, typically glucose for cellular respiration, uh, using oxygen from the environment that we breathe in. All right, we have to have oxygen for this process and turning that into carbon dioxide, which we exhale. When you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide you release what's called metabolic water and energy. Energy in the form of ATP. Again, when you think about mitochondria, the whole idea here is that they produce ATP. The energy that we require for all of our major metabolic activities. If I flex my muscles, close my hands, walk from here to there, I'm burning ATP. When I think about the things I'm saying to you, I'm allowing the neurons in my brain to, to um, have, have communication, via their gated ion channels. This is all ATP based, okay? ATP runs the show here. So cellular respiration, taking the sugar from photosynthesis, using oxygen from the environment, and then through a variety of tricky chemistry um, processes, releasing carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of ATP. Now, these are of course, Oxidation reduction reactions. These are redux reactions as we described previously. Now, let's make sure we're on the same page here. When I think reduced, I think reduced in charge. And if I'm reducing something in charge, what that means is that I am uh, I'm picking up electrons because electrons have a negative charge. The charge goes down when you are reduced, reduced in charge. Oxidation loses electrons or hydrogen atoms whereas reduction gains electrons or hydrogen atoms. So when we look at photosynthesis, the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide gains hydrogen from the water. So the carbon dioxide is reduced to form glucose. In cellular respiration, we have the opposite taking place. We have glucose, which is oxidized. It loses hydrogens to become carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so we are breaking down glucose, releasing two lower energy molecules, and then an energetic molecule in the form of ATP. And that's good enough for me, man. Main goal, oxidation versus reduction, and sort of where the electrons go. Now, here is our given mitochondria. And what I need you to think about here is that it's a lot like a chloroplast. Chloroplasts have like an outer membrane, then a fluid interior called the stroma, and then they have inner membrane structures called thylakoids. I hope that rings a bell to you. Chloroplasts, I'm sorry, mitochondria are the same way. Mitochondria have an outer membrane, they have a fluid interior called the matrix, and then they have inner membrane structures called the cristae, these little inner foldings. These are the cristae. It's very, very similar to a chloroplast. Very similar. All right, cellular respiration. What do we want to say here? Uh, cellular respiration is the process by which cells acquire energy by breaking down nutrient molecules like glucose uh, produced by photosynthesis. Now, this process that we're going to be discussing in detail is referred to as aerobic cellular respiration. And when we say aerobic cellular respiration, aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. Okay? If oxygen is present, then we do aerobic cellular respiration. If oxygen is not present, there are other ways to produce ATP that we're going to talk about at the end. All right? There are other ways to do it. They aren't as good, they're not as efficient, they don't work as well, but you can do it if you have to. The better way is via aerobic cellular respiration because when you break down glucose aerobically into carbon dioxide and water, 
it releases just copious quantities of ATP. Massive, massive quantities of ATP. Now, bear with me here. The, the general energetic efficiency seems like it'd be pretty low, about 39%. So the total amount of energy in glucose when it's broke down through aerobic means, you only get about 39% of that energy back in the form of ATP. But believe it or not, that is really good, right? That is very, 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 very efficient indeed. Uh, most of the energy, as you break down that glucose molecule, it gets lost as heat, and that's entropy, right? Uh, every time there's an energetic transfer from one uh, form to another, there's a net loss of usable energy. That's a loss as heat, that is entropy. That is the second law of thermodynamics, right? Yes, all right, so that is how this works. Now, um, the reason that glucose is so freak, no, 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 let me try again. The reason that aerobic cellular respiration using mitochondria is so incredibly good at breaking down glucose is because it does so in a very slow, controlled methodology. Aerobic cellular respiration is a step by step by step slow process where you make sure that you can harness or harvest, I should say, as much energy from each step as is physically possible. Later on, when we talk about fermentative reactions, uh, where you break down glucose without aerobic cellular respiration, without mitochondria, they break down glucose really fast, really quick. And the side effect is they have very bad, terrible efficiencies. When you break down glucose slowly in a very uh, controlled, stepwise process, it's much more efficient, much more efficient. All right, uh, let's see what else do we want to say here. Our two coenzymes of merit are NAD and FAD, and they are probably like the next thing to talk about, yes. And in the process of cellular respiration, you need to watch for the main players here and see where they come from. Where does the glucose come in? What's the purpose of the oxygen? Where do you release the carbon dioxide? Where does the water go? Where does it come from? And what is the energy? All right, let's talk about NAD and FAD. <coughs> The basic concept here is as follows. Uh, these are going to be coenzymes that assist in carrying energy around in cellular respiration. Coenzymes that help carry energy around in cellular respiration. Basically, NAD is a low energy state, and when it's energized, it becomes NADH. Huh? NADH, it's gained an electron that will be reduced in charge, huh? Reduced high, oxidized low. This is the low energy state, this is the high energy state. You gotta watch for where these are going. FAD and, F, <clears throat> FAD and FADH. FAD is a low energy state, FADH is a high energy state. It's carrying energy around from one place to the next at this stage. Here it is at a low energy state. And here's the thing. These are not destroyed in their reactions. They're simply energy carriers. Think about it like a dump truck. Dump truck carries a load of something from one place to the next, unloads that, then can go back and pick up another load. That is how these function. They are not destroyed in their reactions. They simply convey energy from one place to the next. Cellular respiration, yeah, watch for these, absolutely. Let's get started. These are metabolic pathways, as I've already described. Um, the gist of this is as follows. Let me, let me just lay this on you. Um, I'm going to try my best to keep the questions on your exam about what follows pretty simple. Okay, pretty simple. If we wanted to, we could spend weeks. Like a whole test could be on cellular respiration. It's a very very complicated process. I'm going to put on you just the bones today, all right? Just the bare bones. I don't want to put too much at once, and a lot of this may not be as necessary to your future, and with our current situation, let's just keep it simple. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, but rest assured that the process of cellular respiration is super complex and amazing and elegant and beautiful in so many ways. Basically, we'll, we'll have uh, reactants that are catalyzed by a unique enzyme to form a product, and then that'll become a reactant, a new chemical reaction with a new enzyme to become a product. 
And we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these steps along the way in cellular respiration to eventually get us to a complete oxidative breakdown of glucose molecules. It's very complicated and very fascinating. Okay, perfect. Let's get started. Now, let me just say this as well. The next two, sl the next two slides are really the meat, okay? Uh, the next two slides really contain pretty much everything I really want you to know about cellular respiration, if I'm being honest. Now, you may have a hard time understanding the next two slides without everything else that follows, uh, but the next two slides are the ones that I'd focus on primarily. The first step to this is to realize that cellular respiration has four major phases. These are glycolysis, the prep reaction, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Okay? Glycolysis, prep reaction, citric acid cycle, and ETC, the electron transport chain. Now, where do these happen and how? Let me <laughs> This right here basically contains the vast majority of anything I'd ask you on a test. Okay? Just telling you the truth. And then this slide describes it all. So what you'll have is glycolysis, which happens out in the cytoplasm. It's very important. Glycolysis happens out in the cytoplasm without any influence from mitochondria. Then the PrEP reaction and the citric acid cycle happen inside the mitochondrial matrix. The PrEP reaction kind of happens on the way in. Uh, it is getting things prepared for what's called the citric acid cycle, which is the third step. The citric acid cycle makes molecules necessary to then run the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain takes place on the cristae of the mitochondria. It takes place on the cristae of the mitochondria. So glycolysis outside of the cytoplasm. Prep reaction on the way in in the matrix. Citric acid cycle in the matrix. And then the electron transport chain taking place on the cristae and the output from the electron transport chain being massive quantities of ATP. Yeah, yeah. What they're showing you here is that you find uh, mitochondria in both plant and animal cells. Okay, <clears throat> let's go through and talk about all these steps in a little bit more detail, and then I'll go into lots more detail just so you understand it a little bit better. You'll see. All right, <clears throat> glycolysis. Glycolysis is the first step. Now think about the term set here, right? Glycolysis. Glycolysis. Glyco means sugar. Lysis means to break something down. What we're doing is we are breaking down sugar. And what sugar are we breaking down? Glucose. Glycolysis, to break down glucose. So glycolysis happens first. Uh, this will happen out in the cytoplasm, and basically you break glucose down into pyruvate. Now, if I were you, I'd be friends with what comes into each step and what goes out of each step and what's produced in the middle. Is there energy made? How much? What's the progenitor molecule that everything comes from? What leaves? And in the case of glycolysis, a couple of ATP are made at the end of the day, or formed, I should say, that are available. Glucose comes in and pyruvate goes out. Glucose comes into glycolysis, pyruvate is the resulting molecule. Now, let's see, really I think that's good enough. So that happens out in the cytoplasm. This is independent of mitochondrial activity. This is independent of aerobic respiration. This process happens no matter what. Glycolysis out in the cytoplasm. Uh, next, in the mitochondrial matrix, as it comes in, as pyruvate comes into the prep reaction, pyruvate comes in, uh, it is oxidized inside of that matrix, and what it does is it produces a molecule called acetyl-CoA. Pyruvate comes into the prep reaction, acetyl-CoA goes out. Now, along the way of taking pyruvate on the way in and putting out acetyl-CoA in the mitochondrial matrix in the prep reaction, uh, you'll make a little bit of carbon dioxide, not a whole lot, but a little bit of carbon dioxide. You'll make a little bit of NADH, you know, not a whole bunch, but a, a little bit of NADH. It's a simple process, but at the end of the day, this acetyl-CoA, which leaves and goes into the citric acid cycle, is incredibly important for reasons we'll talk about later on. But the idea is this, pyruvate comes in, acetyl-CoA goes out, along the way you release a little bit of carbon dioxide, you make a little bit of NADH. Next, 
we have the citric acid cycle. Now, the citric acid cycle, you're going to take acetyl-CoA, and that's going to be used to produce just piles of NADH, FADH, and carbon dioxide. Okay? The acetyl-CoA comes in, the citric acid cycle turns, and as the citric acid cycle turns, you make copious quantities of NADH and FADH. You release a little bit of carbon, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase. You release most of the carbon dioxide released through secondary respiration from this as well. Uh, and produce a little bit of ATP along the way as well. Now, this is what you need to be thinking about. What we have been doing through the prep reaction and the citric acid cycle is we've been making NADH and FADH. Here we just made NADH, wherever it is, there. Here we made a lot of NADH and FADH. All of this NADH and FADH, these are high energy molecules now, they are energized. They're gonna go out to the electron transport chain in the cristae of the mitochondria and they're gonna run that electron transport chain. This is a lot like photosynthesis. Remember in the uh, light reaction versus dark reaction of photosynthesis, the light reaction basically makes the energy needed to run the dark reaction. This is not any different from that. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna take the prep reaction and the citric acid cycle, the energy they produce in the form of NADH and FADH, and we're gonna run the electron transport chain. Now, what the heck happens on the electron transport chain on the cristae of that mitochondria? You take the energy from NADH and FADH and you use it to power proton pumps, in essence, or electron pumps in the grand scheme of things. You pump hydrogen into the cristae and you pump it in there and pump it in there and pump it in there and pump it in there using the NADH and FADH released from these two reactions and you pack those cristae full of basically electrons that then have to leave. And they leave through, do I have ATP synthase on here? No, I don't. Yes, I do. There it is. It's behind me. They leave through ATP synthase. And as uh, these hydrogen molecules basically flow through ATP synthase, makes ATP. Nothing fancy. There's nothing fancy happening here. We take glucose and we break that into pyruvate. Pyruvate uh, gets slowly broken down into acetyl-CoA, releasing a little bit of NADH, a little bit of carbon dioxide. Acetyl-CoA enters the citric acid cycle where it's broken down completely and releases energy that is stored in NADH and FADH, both of these, in very high quantities. Side effects, a little bit of carbon dioxide, you exhale that. This energy gets plugged into the electron transport chain to pump hydrogen into the cristae of the mitochondria, and that um, hydrogen leaves via ATP synthase molecules as chemiosmosis, the same thing as we did in photosynthesis, and it cranks out massive, massive quantities of ATP. And uh, just so that we can stay together on this, if you think back to here, one of the outputs from cellular respiration is water. The terminal electron acceptor that picks up the, the low energy hydrogen at the end of the electron transport chain is oxygen that you breathe in. The reason you breathe to get oxygen is to catch the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. So the hydrogen is falling down the electron transport chain, losing energy, and then at the end, you have your oxygen molecule. So hydrogen to oxygen, water, released from the uh, mitochondria as metabolic water. There it is. That's it. That's really all I want from your exam right there. Now, I'm going to go through the rest of this, uh, the, the basic steps along the way, because I think it'll help you to understand what the heck we're talking about. You can try to memorize this, and you probably won't succeed. Uh, but if you understand it a little better, I think you're going to be just fine on this test. So let me run through the net, uh, rest of it, and we'll see kind of what we can get. All right, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> I put this slide on there to illustrate a point. In no world would I ever ask you any of this, <laughs> okay? Ever, ever, ever. But I will point out that when I say that glycolysis is taking uh, glucose and breaking it down into pyruvate and releasing just a little bit of ATP out in the cytoplasm, and I say that that is a metabolic process, a, a um, chain of events, if you will, 
Man, I mean it. What you have here is glucose basically coming in and being broken down into a million different molecules using a million different uh, enzymes catalyzing along the way and eventually at the end of the day kicking out uh, pyruvate. All right? So that is to say that glycolysis is very complicated and we are not going into that detail, okay? And every step along the way is this complicated. I, I simply show you this to sh prove to you, if you will, uh, that this is way more complicated than just what we say here. Uh, now, I will say that glycolysis is kind of fascinating because it happens out in the cytoplasm. We assume that this is pre-mitochondrial origin. So this probably was the first way that uh, eukaryotic cells were making energy, like ATP energy, uh, which is fascinating. But yeah, yeah, it's very, very complicated. Now, glycolysis. What I would like for you to understand from this is there's basically two steps along the way. What's referred to as an energy investment step and an energy harvesting step. And um, how deep do we want to go? Let's just keep this pretty surface. So the energy investment step, what you do is you take glucose and you break it down. And as you break it into two individual molecules, you use two ATPs, one per side, to uh, sort of augment the energy state, if you will, of these broken down glucose molecules. The long story short is that you produce G3P. The whole reason I'm explaining this is to show you that G3P that's produced here, G3P. Uh, does that sound familiar? It should, that's the end product of photosynthesis. G3P is an incredibly uh, easily worked molecule. It's good for making lots and lots and lots of different things, including continuing through glycolysis. So as G3P continues through hydrolysis, uh, I'm sorry, uh, glycolysis, it releases a little bit of an NADH along the way. And then as it moves through, as these molecules are broken down in stepwise format using a variety of different enzymes, you kick out a total of four ATP molecules. Now, pay attention, this is important. Through this energy harvesting step, you make four ATP molecules, yet what we say is that there's a net gain of two ATP from glycolysis, remember this? Boom, two ATP net gain. What we're trying to get at here is that it takes two ATP to run this and you make four. So two of these are gonna remain behind to run glycolysis while you gain two ATP from the system. Um, I realize that seems kind of complicated, but it's kind of elegant in the grand scheme. So you make what you need to run the process again. This is cyclic, glycolysis is cyclic. Okay, so take home messages. Glycolysis, glycolysis makes two ATP molecules. This is done out in the cytoplasm. And at the end of the day, what you form is pyruvate. That's really all I need from you. Yeah, just like this says. So glycolysis uh, produces a couple of ATP, net gain, and pyruvate. Now, where is this done out in the cytoplasm? And then we have an important concept to discuss. And that is the presence or lack thereof of oxygen. After glycolysis, when you've made pyruvate, if oxygen is present, goes to the prep reaction, okay? going to continue along the way into the prep reaction and do aerobic cellular respiration. But if oxygen is not present after glycolysis, you enter what's called a fermentative pathway. And we'll be talking about that fermentative pathway a little bit later on. Remember, this is aerobic cellular respiration. That's what we're trying to do. It's the best way to do business. It works better. But if you, if you have to, if there's no oxygen available, you can do fermentation and make us a little bit of energy. Okay, prep reaction. This is the next step. So glycolysis has taken glucose and made pyruvate from it. Now we're going to take pyruvate. We're going to make acetyl-CoA. Where is that at? There it is. We're going to make acetyl-CoA. This is going to happen in the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, how deep do we want to go here? We're going to produce a little bit of NADH. We're going to release a little bit of uh, carbon dioxide. I tell you, I, don't, I really don't want to get too deep into this at all. So remember, part of the output of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide, and it's a little bit, a little bit of that is released here from the PrEP reaction. So what comes into the PrEP reaction? Pyruvate. What comes out of the PrEP reaction? Acetyl-CoA and a little bit of carbon dioxide and a little bit of NADH. 
Where does it happen? In the matrix of the mitochondria. That's good enough for me. It's a prep reaction. You're getting pyruvate ready to enter the citric acid cycle. All right, the citric acid cycle is where the magic happens. Glycolysis makes pyruvate always, and then the mitochondria need something else to run the citric acid cycle. So the prep reaction makes it, and that is acetyl-CoA. Now, let's see here. What do we want to say about the citric acid cycle? Uh, the idea is that, yeah, good enough. The idea is that you take the acetyl-CoA from the prep reaction and you put it through a variety of processes, many, many stepwise processes along the way, and what you end up kicking out is citric acid. Okay, you end up kicking out citric acid. And what will happen here is throughout this process, you're making energy and making energy and making energy in the form of NADH and FADH. These are high energy molecules. You also crank out massive quantities of carbon dioxide here. The idea of the citric acid cycle is that you make huge quantities of NADH, huge quantities of FADH, you make a little bit of ATP, and you make a lot of carbon dioxide that you exhale. You make a little bit of carbon dioxide in the prep reaction, you make a lot more in the citric acid cycle. You make a little bit of NADH, wherever it is, in the prep reaction, but you make a lot of NADH and FADH in the citric acid cycle. The main goal here of the citric acid cycle is to make huge quantities of NADH and FADH. These are then going to go on and power the electron transport chain, which is where we're at, I hope. Yes, okay, good. So, what's the point of the electron transport chain? What will happen with the electron transport chain is that you uh, take the NADH, the FADH that's been produced along the way throughout this process, you take the NADH and the FADH, and they power proton pumps. Stepwise, along the way, all the energy gets dumped into these electron transport chains, and along the way, they're powering proton pumps to pump hydrogen into the uh, um, the cristae, basically, into these little undulations. They pump hydrogen in. Good enough for me. So once we have built up this crazy electrochemical gradient, there's all of this hydrogen just packing on one side of the membrane of the cristae. It's going to want to flow back across. And as the hydrogen molecules flow back across, they only have one path which they can take. And that path is through what are called ATP synthase complexes. ATP synthase. It ends in ASC. So what is it? It's an enzyme. And it's ATP synthase. Synth synthase, right? Synthase. To synthesize. That means to make something. ATP synthase. We're making something. And it's ATP synthase. So it's an enzyme that makes ATP. Ta-da! Where does it get the energy to make ATP? It gets it from the prep reaction. It gets it from the citric acid cycle in the form of NADH and FADH. The NADH and FADH power the proton pumps that force hydrogen via active transport into concentration, and that hydrogen then leaves via ATP synthase, spinning it like a motor and making ATP via a process called oxidative phosphorylation. This, this is chemiosmosis. The same form of chemiosmosis that you saw in photosynthesis. It's the same concept, all right? This is the same concept. All right, now, at the end of the electron transport chain, as we are flowing through this ETC, flowing through the electron transport chain, these hydrogens go from a high energy state to a low energy state, and at the very end of the electron transport chain is the oxygen that you inhale. So when I inhale, I'm getting oxygen, and then the hydrogens down the electron transport chain hit that oxygen, and as they do so, they form water, and that's the metabolic water that you kick out from the end of cellular respiration. That's that metabolic water. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good enough, man. Uh, and the idea here is that this ATP synthase complex just makes huge amounts of ATP, okay, in the 30s. 32 to 34, really more than that, depending upon how we do things, but in the 30s, ATP, like massive quantities, massive quantities of ATP via chemiosmosis using ATP synthase and an electrochemical gradient built up by 
these proton pumps in the electron transport chain. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's about it. That's about it. So at the end of the electron transport chain, the electrons, hydrogen, binds to water and forms uh, metabolic water as we described here. And then I feel like there's one more little nuance I want to add in here. Where we're headed is to photo, no, 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 is to fermentation reactions. So why is oxygen so important? Why, if you cut off an oxygen supply, do you end up with problems? If these electrons are flowing down the electron transport chain and they get to the last step and there is no oxygen, they have nowhere to go. And what you have to think about here is that it's like a conveyor belt. As long as the conveyor belt is moving and stuff getting dumped on it, as long as it keeps moving, you're good to go. No stress. But if you clog up the end and stuff keeps moving down that conveyor belt, you get this massive buildup of material and the whole thing shuts down. If there is no oxygen from breathing at the end of the electron transport chain, it locks up the entire mitochondria. If you can't get the oxygen, I'm sorry, if you can't get the hydrogens onto the oxygen, if there's no oxygen there, the hydrogens at low energy get locked up here, then they just pack into this, and all this shuts down, the uh, citric acid cycle stops turning because there's nowhere for the NADH and FADH to go. You end up locking up the prep reaction because there's nowhere for acetyl-CoA to go because the citric acid cycle's locked up. The whole thing stops, okay? It just locks right on up. And in that case, you would then go into fermentative reactions. Now, before I do that, let's do this. Uh, the net yield per glucose molecule from glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport chain. You can do your own math. Uh, my goal here is for you to understand that the complete oxidative breakdown of glucose yields about 36 ATP. That would be uh, 263 kilocalories of energy. Uh, that is about 39% efficiency. Now, where does the rest of this energy go? It's lost via entropy. It's Lost via entropy as heat, bear with me. Lost via entropy as heat. Uh, and so this number, though it seems low, 39% efficiency is actually pretty darn good in the grand scheme of things. That's not bad at all. Uh, now, we need to have a little bit of a conversation. Aerobic endurance, anaerobic threshold, and muscle fatigue. So if you are in fantastic shape and you stand up from where you're sitting right now and you go running out, some of you could just jog for days, okay? You are very uh, high in what we call aerobic endurance. Uh, your muscles have lots of mitochondria. Uh, your muscles have lots of uh, uh, small fibers that are wrapped in capillary beds. You're just really efficient, okay? The muscles are really like a soccer player or something, okay? Their muscles are just so efficient, man. They just work so well. So their endurance is really elevated, but I invite you to pause this video and do something terrible. Pause this video, stay on YouTube, and type in uh, something like marathon ending fails or something like that. I have had some, probably something along those lines. And you can see marathon runners in fantastic shape trying to sprint out the end of a race and running out of ATP. And when they run out of ATP, they just fall over. There's nothing they can do. The legs just stop working. And they hit the ground, you see them army crawling to the end. That's because they crossed what's called an anaerobic threshold and started producing unwanted substances that don't work as well for what we need to do, and they end up having fatigue in their musculature. Uh, the buildup of lactic acid, you probably have heard of this before. Uh, you end up with cramps. Uh, the muscles want to flex, but they can't. They lock up. Uh, later, you hurt, you get what's called the uh, DOMS, or delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, aches and pains in the grand scheme of things. You can end up damaging the sarcoplasmic reticulums of your muscles and causing all sorts of hell. Uh, but all of this, all of this stems from not having efficient musculature, not being able to get the oxygen in to the mitochondria or the mitochondria to work fast enough to make enough ATP for the system to function. That comes from pushing the body too hard. In this form of cellular respiration, what we're going to do is as follows. Pyruvate is made by glycolysis. Pyruvate will be there no matter what. But 
if oxygen is present, you're going to do complete oxidative breakdown, aerobic respiration, aerobic in the presence of air, oxygen. But if oxygen is not present, you begin the process of what's called anaerobic fermentation or fermentative reactions. And depending upon what kind of organism you are, you'll either do lactic fermentation, like what we do, we form lactic acid, you probably are aware of that, or they can do what's called alcohol or carbon dioxide fermentation. And that's a story for another day. But you can do one or the other, okay? This is how this process works. If there is no oxygen, you enter fermentative pathways, and that would be one of these. All right, fermentation is an anaerobic process. That means without the presence of oxygen. And that'll either be through the process of lactate fermentation or alcohol and carbon dioxide fermentation. Uh, alcohol fermentation, eh, things like yeast do this, and you are aware of this because of uh, like beer and spirits. One of the things that we do here is we put yeast into a sugary solution and the yeast eat the sugar till they die. And as they are eating the sugar and fermenting it because there's no oxygen, they release alcohol and that's the alcohol you drink, okay? Uh, that is alcohol fermentation. Breads are the same concept. So the reason that bread rises when it gets warm is because you've basically taken a dough of sugar and you've put yeast in that and kneaded it all together and then you warmed it up so the yeast start fermenting the sugars and releasing carbon dioxide so the bread rises. The reason you look at a slice of bread that's got holes in it is because yeast were in there producing carbon dioxide. And that's just how this works. Uh, and then alternatively, lactic acid fermenters, uh, anything that you consume which is fermented and tastes sour, like sauerkraut or kimchi or you name it, uh, it's going to be fermented by lactic acid fermenting organisms. A lot of bacteria do this, fungi do this as well, uh, yogurt, sauerkraut, certain cheeses certainly can do this process, but it is fermentated, it's a fermentation process. And uh, my take home message to you is as follows. There are advantages of uh, fermentative reactions. Uh, they're really fast. Like, look at all this madness, right? Look at all this madness. Look at all this, all this, like all this crazy stuff that has to happen for aerobic breakdown. You gotta go through this electron transport chain. It takes a long time, okay? It takes a long time to do complete oxidative breakdown. Fermentation breaks down glucose just like that. Okay, really fast indeed. Now, by comparison, hang on, is that all I wanna say? Yeah, okay. So emergency situations, uh, you can provide yourself a little bit of ATP via fermentative processes. There are downsides. Lactic acid and alcohol, some of the output from uh, fermentative reactions, it's toxic, hurts. Uh, one of the reasons if you do really strenuous exercise, uh, the next day you're sore is because the lactic acid screws the pH up in your muscles and can cause damage to your uh, internal cellular mechanics, if you will. The yeast, okay, the yeast in a bottle of delicious Bale's Oberon beer, uh, that layer of white at the bottom, that's dead yeast. They produced alcohol until the environment became so toxic that it killed them. So then they sank out to the bottom. That is a disadvantage, okay? Uh, the outputs of fermentation, some of them, not just APP, but some of the other outputs like lactic acid and alcohol are quite toxic and damaging to cells. Now, efficiency. Fermentation is inefficient. It is very, very inefficient. It doesn't work well at all in the grand scheme of efficiency only about 2.1% of the energy from glucose is going to be uh, kicked out as ATP from fermentation. So only two ATP per glucose are produced compared to aerobic respiration where you make 36 to 38 ATP per glucose molecule. All right, so fermentation is inefficient. This is not a good way to make lots of ATP. You don't really want to do this to your glucose if you can keep from it. All right, let's change gears just a little bit here. So, um, metabolism. When you eat, you don't just eat glucose. And you hopefully know this. 
Uh, when you consume a meal like this, you're getting proteins, you're getting fats, you're getting nucleic acids, you're getting a variety of different uh, sugars like starches and cellulose and you name it. You're getting all sorts of different molecules. It ain't just glucose. But your body is capable in most cases of taking whatever the heck that is and plugging it into your uh, cellular, respirative, cellular respirative pathways in one way, shape, form, or another. So you can take these molecules, be them fats or whatever, and turn them into things that are necessary for cellular respiration in the event that you need to. Now, there's a couple of term sets that we need to talk about. These are degradation, lysis, and catabolism. Degradation means to break something down. Lysis, these are lysis reactions. We're breaking things down. They are catabolic, like a catastrophe. They're catabolic. We are breaking things down. And when we are breaking things down, like taking a steak and turning it into amino acids, when we're breaking things down, these tend to be exergonic. They release energy. By comparison, there are synthesis reactions. Synthesis reactions are anabolic. They are making things. And when you are making things, you tend to be taking small molecules and making them into a larger molecule that tends to be endergonic or energy storing. So let's discuss. This is very, very important. When you eat, this food stuff gets poured into what we would refer to as a metabolic pool. Fats, for example, break down into, if you recall, triglycerides, uh, glycerol, and fatty acid chains. Uh, the glycerol gets broken down into a molecule that's plugged into glycolysis. The fatty acids break down into acetyl-CoA, which gets plugged into the citric acid cycle. The gist of this is, as you well know, if I asked you, what's the function of fat? I hope you'd say energy storage is one of your answers. Uh, one fat triglyceride molecule, one triglyceride molecule, stores enough energy to make about 300 ATP molecules. We use energy, I'm sorry, we use fat as an energy storage. It works like a charm. Amino acids from proteins. So you eat a steak that contains a lot of protein, you break those proteins down into amino acids. Uh, those amino acids get broken up. It's called deamination. Don't worry about it. That's what happens. Uh, basically, you kick off ammonia from them, from the uh, 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 amino acids. You kick off the ammonia groups, and that gets dealt with by your kidneys. So you probably realize that your kidneys release uh, uric acid and ammonia-like products. Uh, via the urine. That's what's happening here. But the long story short is that these amino groups get converted into pyruvate acetyl-CoA, uh, which get plugged into cellular respiration. That's how this works. So you can take these and you can kick them right into cellular respiration. That's the goal here. All right. It's take-home message time, folks. Take-home message. The energy organelles revisited. So basically think of this as a compare and contrast between um, whatever that is, chloroplast and mitochondria. There we go. So chloroplast have an inner membrane system called thylakoids. Mitochondria have an inner membrane system called the cristae. Cristae, thylakoids. Same concept, it's just inner membranes. Both of these have electron transport chains. The electron transport chains are located on the thylakoids of the chloroplast and on the cristae of the mitochondria. Photosynthesis. Okay, where are we at? Okay. In photosynthesis, electrons are passed uh, to the electron transport chain, energized from the sun, uh, whereas the, uh, the energy for the electron transport chains on mitochondria come from glucose that's broken down. It, you know, we're going back and forth here. We, we know about chemiosmosis. I've established already uh, that the way in which these can produce a lot of ATP when it's necessary is uh, through chemiosmosis. So using ATP synthase complexes, you pack the membrane full of hydrogen. That hydrogen leaves via the ATP synthase molecules. This is called chemiosmosis, and you can make ATP from this. I mean, they're very similar is what I'm trying to get at here. Chloroplast and mitochondria, they are very similar. Uh, in chloroplast, the stroma has Calvin cycle enzymes. In mitochondria, the matrix contains enzymes for the citric acid cycle. So they both have a cyclic system in their inner membrane fluid. You know, that's how this works. All right, major take home messages energy flows and matter cycles. Oh man, what do you want to say here? The carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, you name it. 
in, or I should say, on this planet is constantly cycling. You have atoms in you right now that were part of other animals a year ago. You have atoms in you right now that were part of mammoths, you know, 50,000 years ago. You have atoms in you right now that were in freaking dinosaurs 75 million years ago, okay? It's all the same stuff. You don't have a lot of give and take of matter on a planet like this. It's, it's maintained. It cycles constantly. The matter cycles, whereas the energy flows, okay? Minor technical difficulties. Uh, the energy flows, whereas the matter cycles. The energy comes in from the sun and is re-radiated back out into space. That is entropy. Classic second law of thermodynamics, that is entropy. All life, all life depends upon solar energy. Uh, chemical cycle, yep, 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 yep. Chloroplasm, mitochondrial energy, yep, yep, yep. And I think that's it. All right, that's good enough for me. So uh, that's the end of this test materials. I think I already have a quiz up on this stuff, so get on it and get ready for your exam. Right, thanks, guys.